G'day everyone, it's Curtis here and welcome to an On The Back Wheel video. Today I'm reviewing Aprilia's take on the mid-size sports bike, the RS660. Let's see whether or not it's a good bike and if I buy one. Before we get into the review, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button or the dislike button. It really helps the channel out and make sure you check out some other small motor vloggers too. I know it'll help them out. All right, let's do it. Let's start off with the looks and design of the Aprilia. I don't think it's just me when I say that it's an absolutely gorgeous bike. I mean, Aprilia have absolutely knocked it out of the park with the look of this bike. My gauge for motorcycle looks is my wife. <laughs> I rode this in and when I got home, she went, that's a nice bike. If my wife says it's a nice bike, that means, damn, that bike is absolutely stunning. <laughs> Starting at the front, we've got new LED light system with daylight running lights as well. Aero fairing, so it goes down into here, then pops out here. This helps suck air away from the rider and also forces air into the engine to cool it down. And apparently it's for aerodynamics as well, helps with stability. At the front, we got a red wheel, and at the back, we have a black wheel. Some people like it, some people don't. I personally love it. We've got beautiful pipes that come down here into a underslung exhaust system. That sounds fantastic. Nice Aprilia logo here, RS660 badge here, the big Aprilia A right there. Aprilia Racing written here. And then we've got this subtle little Italian flag that they snuck in, very nice. We've got the red accent on the front, a bright red seat, and a black tail. So. I think it looks gorgeous. Some people don't like all the colors. They'd like it all just to be black. And I know the red seat is a bit contentious. I like it. I think it looks great, but some people would prefer a black seat. And that is completely understandable. On the tank, you can see it's quite scalloped. That's for your knees to go in there. And it fits in quite well. I like the design. Uh, back here, we've got a completely new rear tail section. I'll get into that later. But basically, it allows for the rear seat to be popped off and it's got like a rack here already, a firm rack where you can put other accessories on there or you can just click a tail bag on there or tie it on. Got passenger pegs here which are very easy to remove. They're just two bolts that are easily accessible on either side. So if you want to clean up the rear end or you've only want single seat registration, that's very easy to take off. We've got this banana style swing arm, a bit more simple than the RSV4 and Tawano models, uh, the V4 models but I still think it looks fantastic. The RS660 comes with Pirelli Rosso Corsa 2 tires. These are an amazing tire. They're absolutely fantastic. I love it when a motorcycle comes with good stock tires. You can see the shock is connected directly to the swing arm, no linkage. Uh, also on the back here, this, I think it looks fantastic, but it'll look even better with the tail tidy. And thankfully, there's only a couple of bolts there, so it's very easy to remove and put on your own tail tidy. We've got your chain guard here, kind of like your fake faux carbon here that's actually just plastic. Come around, all this is well encased. I like this design here. It's all plastic, but it looks fantastic. Uh, here, you can see on the exhaust collector here, unfortunately, it does get a bit of road grime, so you have to keep that clean regularly with a bit of the greaser or something like that. Got the aero fairing on this side as well. See a little quick shifter here, up and down quick shifter. Coming up here, it's the same on this side. It's very scalloped, very well designed. Up the front, we got a very nice triple tree. Got the Imprilia embossed here. At the front, we have a TFT dash, adjustable suspension front and rear, and some half decent mirrors. Overall, I think Aprilia have nailed design. It looks fantastic and it's a great looking bike. And it's cleverly designed. There's only a couple little things I can nitpick, which I'll show you right now. The front and rear suspension are adjustable for preload and dampening. See at the front we can get it to it quite easily here. Here's your preload and there's your dampening on both sides. On the rear you adjust your preload here but unfortunately the rebound or dampening is all the way up in here. It's so high up you can't even see it. To adjust the rebound and access it you need to take off the rear seat, this seat and then undo two allen key bolts here to take off this fairing and then you can get the screw in through here. I wish they either just put a hole through here to adjust the rebound or a remote reservoir on the shock. The RS660 doesn't have any heel guards so to get around rubbing on your swing arm they put on this plastic laminate style here but as you can see it's coming off and doesn't last long. The Aprilia has a good turning circle but unfortunately at full lock your hands and arm are touching your tank which makes it very awkward and uncomfortable doing tight turns. Overall, these are nitpicks, and everything bar that turning circle can be fixed quite easily. And I think they've knocked it out of the park. It's a great looking bike, and it's well designed. Okay, let's talk about the heart of the motorcycle, the engine. The RS660 has a parallel twin, and thankfully it has a different firing order, so it sounds fantastic. It doesn't sound like a lawnmower like other parallel twins can do. It's got 100 horsepower, plenty of torque, and a six-speed box. 
We got all the tech, including an up and down quick shifter. If we turn it on, we got five engine modes, including three for the street, individual, commute, and dynamic. The individual riding mode is adjustable. We got engine mapping, engine braking, traction control, wheelie control, and ABS. We've also got race settings, challenge, and time attack. Both of these are fully customizable. We've got cruise control, which is absolutely fantastic. I didn't think I'd like it, but it's brilliant to use. I have to say the cruise control of this works fantastic. <laughs> yes, I'm in a 50 km hour zone, I don't need to be using it, but it's keeping me at the speed limit for one. Well, making me go over downhill, but that's okay. And it's keeping my hand to rest. Um, I've been riding for a couple of hours. I've done about 200 kilometers and it was just getting a bit sore every now and again. So on the highway sections, pop on the cruise control, give your throttle hand a rest, a bit of a stretch, and then you're good to go for the twisties, like the ones that are coming up just on the road here. The engine on the RS660 is absolutely fantastic. It's kind of grunty and talky and very easy to ride down low, but when you hit 7,000 RPM, boom, it really takes off and it goes. Yes, it only has 100 horsepower, but only, that's plenty and more than enough for the street. And one of the great things is, you can really hold this thing flat and ride it hard. Something like my KTM Super Duke, for example, you're only at half throttle and you're at go to jail speed straight away. And speaking of speeds, little old me got a ticket yesterday on this. <laughs> so you guys owe me, because I've been testing this bike to the limit. <laughs> you know, it did actually cross my mind. Do I drop a gear and disappear here? I could have easily got away, but no. Little old me did the right thing and pulled over, but oh well, you win some and you lose some. So when the bike first came out, overseas publishers were saying that it had a flat spot in the mid range and bottom end there. I have tried my hardest to find that and I haven't been able to find any flat spot at all. Maybe it's not a flat spot, but more that when it hits 7,000, it takes off so much. You know, it's a big kick and power, almost two stroke like that when you're in that four to five to six thousand region maybe you know it doesn't have that jump it's kind of just a linear power where then it steps up so maybe that's what they're talking about but i find it really grunty and when you're in that four to five thousand rpm range it's great for the street it's punchy it's talky and it's kind of keeping it in that mid range but then you want to have a real play you just whack drop it down a gear and you hit that seven thousand and boom just whack through the quick shifter and it's an absolute blast Overtaking, no issues at all. It always has ample power. It's just a fantastic motor. It's so flexible too. Like the only time I think you'd run out of power with this is on the track when you're riding with your mates on their bombed out 600s and thousands, and when you're doing high speed overtaking. But you know, here in Australia, you're not really sitting on those speeds much because you get in trouble like Curtis did, or you're gonna lose your license. So I think it's a great motor in that you can ride it really hard. Um, you can hold it flat, like you have literally hold it flat in every single gear and wind it on and bang through the quick shifter and you're not doing monopoly speeds, you know, you're still keeping it reasonable. Another thing, the fueling is spot on. It's near on perfect. Like even the on-on throttle response, one of my big bugbears of motorcycles is absolutely perfect. The Prilly engineers have nailed it there. The fueling is fantastic. The only nitpick I have with the motor is the downshifter. Now the downshifter is an auto blip as well. When using the clutch, no problems at all. But it's got the function there, I want to use it. So if you don't hit it clean or you're not aggressive enough with it, you'll press down and the bike will lurch forward and not change gears or it will lurch forward and then change gears. So you need to make sure you hit it square and be quite assertive with it. Ah, oh, the f down blip it didn't work. There has been one occasion and only one where it wouldn't change from second to first. It was just stuck. It was stuck and nothing would happen. So I had to actually stop, pull the clutch in and then go down gear and then it changed. But that was only once. Now I've been riding a lot. I find that if you're riding the bike aggressively and doing higher RPM downshifts, it works great. Nearly every time it is absolutely perfect. But you know, just in the back of your mind when you're doing slower speeds, just be wary. You've got to be positive. You've got to hit it square and go boom, boom. So that's a learning experience for me and for the bike. I think maybe with uh, a software update, it could be improved. The upshifter works absolutely perfect. Like, absolutely perfect at mild acceleration or hard acceleration, it's spot on. You still don't want to use it when you're coasting. Uh, it will work and most of the time it's perfect, but that's not what quick shifters are designed for usually. They're designed for hard acceleration and that's why they just sound amazing. And one of the great things is when you're cruising on this, 
if you just cruise it along and you just pop it up a couple of years, it has a real, you know, that explosion of gases that just sounds absolutely awesome. I love quick shifters, I just think they're the best. <laughs> when you hit roughly four to 5,000 RPM, it has a real intake growl. It sounds absolutely fantastic. And after that, that's when you get the actual exhaust to take over and it makes a great growl. Honestly, I don't think I touched the exhaust at all. It sounds fantastic and the fueling is spot on. Maybe, maybe after a couple of years or whatever, I'll go chasing more performance. That's probably likely to happen if I was to own this, <laughs> let's be honest. How they got around the noise test for this, I don't know. Probably always seem to have a couple of little tricks up their bag there. I think maybe it might be a butterfly that opens when it kicks into gear and then maybe even opens up further when you hit about four or 5,000 RPM. But it sounds fantastic. They've done a great job uh, with the sound of this bike. Let's talk about the engine modes. So on the engine modes, it's got those three street modes. Honestly, I fiddle with the commute and dynamic modes and I just leave it on the individual mode. The individual mode allows you to basically set it to just the fastest settings for everything and the least intrusive. So I turn the traction control right down. So it does nearly nothing. Well, only when you really do something silly and the wheelie control off and the rear ABS off. I think this is the best setting and Honestly, for the power and feeling of this bike, I would never ever change it. I rode it in some terrible conditions, like the first week I had the bike, it was only pouring down rain, so, you know, I didn't have a choice. I was like, well, I've got to ride the bike, I've got to put some miles on it. So, I was riding in terrible conditions and I did not have an issue at all riding with it in the fastest mode. I've tried the track modes out and basically I think they're useless on the street because it takes away your sp speedometer and everything. You can adjust to the exact same settings using the individual mode, uh, just on the track, it's easier because you can adjust both and you can also adjust your traction control using your cruise control uh, using the track modes, which is a fantastic. I think, you know, they can't do that with the street mode because they're using that dedicated for cruise control. I kind of wish you could use that on the uh, street and that the cruise control button would only work when cruise control was activated so you go up and down to adjust the traction control. But honestly, I just left it on the lowest setting and you wouldn't even know it was there. So that to me means that the electronics are working fantastic. There was only one occasion when I went for a ride over Mount Glorious here, which is really twisty and it was after the rains had happened. So there's a couple of sections were quite wet and I was exiting a corner getting a little bit silly and I wound it on and I could feel it kick in for the first time. And it, just a little bit of a, uh, hey, you're getting a bit silly, control yourself. And I think that's exactly one from electronics. And honestly, you could probably get away with a model with no electronics. I'd love one with just one engine map, everything set at the fastest setting, ABS and a quick shifter. If that was a thousand bucks cheaper, I would buy that model. You probably guessed it, but I really like this motor. It sounds great, it goes great, and the fueling is fantastic. On paper, you're probably going, oh, 100 horsepower, that's not much compared to a ZX6 or any other sports bike that have 130, 140 horsepower or something, but how it makes it is a really fun way Torquey down low has a big kick in power, so it's got that fun factor still, and just an absolute blast. I love the motor. Okay, let's talk about the suspension. The suspension on this bike is good, not great. The forks are adjustable for preload and dampening. The rear shock is also adjustable for preload and dampening. So we got one clicker here on this fork, and another clicker on this fork, and also your preload here and there. And the same on the other side, it's on the top of the fork. I can't show you unless I take off the seat and the side cover, unfortunately. I think the best way to talk about the suspension is go for a ride and go on one of my test roads uh, and show you how it performs. So this right here is my motorcycle suspension test road because it starts off smooth and flowy and you can pretty well grab me if you're in leathers and get a bit silly. And then it turns into a bumpy, cornery mess. It feels fantastic on this section. Could use a little bit more preload in the back. I feel like it's sitting just a little bit low. Besides that, great. Changing road surfaces. Oh, got the big g there. Pretty good so far, the suspension. A little bit busy in the rear. Couple of bigger bumps there, handled them pretty well. Whoa, whoa. 
the front suspension is pretty good. The rear, not quite as good. Feels a bit busy and a little bit like it's kind of bottoming out almost. Okay, so let's break that section down. The suspension is pretty good, but not amazing. Now, I've ridden similar roads already like that before, and I get similar feedback in that the rear is not as good as the front. The forks are very good. Uh, I adjusted the rebound a little bit, added a couple of clicks in. I set the preload as well. I set that three down for full, and they're both even, and that seems to be a really good setting. It's kind of firm, but not too stiff where it doesn't take the bigger bumps and, you know, soak up the smaller stuff. It doesn't dive too much on the braking either. The rear, when the going gets a bit rough, it gets a bit choppy and a little bit bouncy. If I added a bit more preload into the rear, I think that would help it because when it gets rough, it kind of blows through a bit. So it's got this kind of bad combination where it's stiff, a little bit bouncy, but also bottoms out. So not ideal. One of the issues you have with the suspension is kind of mid-spec, mid-tier, in that it has preload and dampening adjustment, that's it. And the dampening is compression and rebound in one clicker, see? This one clicker here on both sides, and the same in a shock, that's your compression and rebound. So as you increase the rebound to settle it down, you're also stiffening the fork and shock. It seems to work well for the fork, but not for the shock. So I believe the RS660 should really have higher spec suspension for the price. It should have suspension that is adjustable for rebound and compression, and it should have a shock that has a remote reservoir as well. So if we look here, you can see how the rebound is performing on the rear shock. I think it needs a bit more rebound adjustment. And unfortunately, as you adjust the rebound, it also stiffens up the rear, which is kind of its own problem in itself. But I can see here that it kind of waves a bit. See, it dips in and there, out, dips in and out, dips in and out. It's quite good now and it's better, but you want that to be completely smooth and a straight line uh, where the harder rubber matches the softer outer rubber. So you can see there, engage the rebound from that. It could definitely be improved a little bit. Overall, once you set up the suspension, it is quite good. I really like the front fork. However, the rear shock is kind of limited. Uh, it's already at the end of its adjustment for me and my weight and ability. If you're going to the track or something, I think you'd really need to look in getting the uh, rear shock worked on or replacing the rear shock. Otherwise, very good suspension all around. I just wish it was that bit better. All right, let's talk about my favorite feature of the RS660. It's handling. This thing handles like an absolute dream, and I go as far to say as it's one of the best handling bikes I've ever ridden. Yes, that is a bold statement, but as soon as you get on this bike, it just feels fantastic. And as soon as I hit the first couple of turns on this, I was like, oh my goodness, this is like telepathic riding this thing. And initially I thought maybe a tiny bit slow tipping in the corners, but then you just ride it a little bit more aggressive and lean it over further and it just keeps going and it just absolutely sticks. It's so stable, yet mid corner, you can still change direction quite easily. In traffic, it's so good to ride. Oh my God, like if you want a lane split, it just feels so stable and it's nimble and narrow. You just slide through the traffic and the mirrors are at a good height in that they go under the traffic generally, which is fantastic. So your cars, and your trucks and utes just go straight under. So you don't have to worry about it. And they're at a great width. The width of them is exactly the same as the bars, perhaps even narrower. To find the limits of this bike, you really need to take it onto the track. On the street, you just can't find the limits. It handles fantastic. It may sound like I'm waxing lyrical about the handling on this bike, but it's honestly that good. It is just such a good handling motorcycle. You're gonna find the limits of the suspension before the handling. And that's kind of disappointing, but Oh, man, it is a brilliant handling motorcycle. Well done, Aprilia. So the next most logical thing to talk about is the comfort and the riding position of the bike. If we have a look back, it's definitely not as aggressive as an R6, a ZX6, 
you know, ZX10 or something like that. The bars are a little bit higher and the pegs are a little bit lower, but they've managed to uh, keep the ground clearance at the same time. So you see the bar to peg ratio is a little bit more relaxed, not quite sports touring, but definitely not full on committed sports bike. So when I first rode this home, I thought, well, this is just a sports bike, isn't it? It just feels like a sports bike. But then I remembered my old ZX10s, my Jigsaw 1000s and stuff like that. And I remembered, hang on, they were a lot more uncomfortable in that like I'd ride them home at the end of a long day of work and I'd be like, oh, at the end of the day, I'd be like, oh man, this thing is getting uncomfortable. Whereas this, I've been riding a couple hundred Ks a day and I feel great at the end. I'll have a stop in the middle about, you know, 100 kilometers or so mark, but I honestly feel great. And that's kind of a testament to how they designed this bike in that it is, has so much performance. It handles so good, the engine is fantastic, but it's still reasonably comfortable. Do I want to do 1,000 kilometer days on it? Hell to the no. This is not a sports tourer. It is not a tourer by any means. It is still a proper sports bike. But for commuting to and from work, and let's say on the way home from work, you want to go through some corners at your local kind of canyons, it's perfect for that. Hell, if this is a bike you just want to have for track days and then ride to and from work every now and again, then on the weekends, go ride with your mates to a two, 300 kilometer day. This is the perfect bike for that. The seat, oh, it is a fantastic seat. It's got this nice grippy material, almost motocross like, but it's got a lot of cushion. Like look at all that cushion. I'm pressing down really hard and not hitting any frames or anything like that. It is just a fantastic design. And the rear is very similar. In combination with the riding position, they've nailed it. They've really nailed it. Just be wary that it's not a tourer. This is still a sports bike through and through, but a very comfortable sports bike at that. Let's talk about the brakes. Up the front, we've got dual discs, which are mid-spec Brembo's. We've got a Brembo radial master cylinder, which is fantastic, and also a Brembo rear. The front brakes are very good, borderline fantastic. They're very, very good brakes. They don't require a really big pull to be powerful, and they're not sharp and grabby either at the same time. Really, I think the front brakes fit this bike perfectly. Unfortunately, the rear, I'm not sure whether they're just not bled properly or they're just terrible rear brakes. I've found a lot of Brembo rear brakes to be like this. Pretty much, not much happens. <laughs> it pretty much feels like nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, and then you get up to the very bottom and it locks up a little bit. It's, they're pretty bad, to be honest. I checked the tread and everything. They're new brake pads, and they've only got 1,500 kilometers on as well, so they shouldn't be too bad. I haven't tried bleeding the brakes. It's not my bike, it's a Prelius bike, so I didn't want to fiddle with it too much. Um, but I got a feeling that's just how they are. They're just not very good rear brakes, which is disappointing because the fronts are fantastic. The clutch is light and easy to use, but, and a big but is, it's quite a big reach. I wear a large glove, sometimes it's a medium, but mostly a large, and I'm at the extent of my reach. I would not want it any further out whatsoever. And these are non-adjustable as well. So what you get is what you get. If you want to change it, you're going to have to replace uh, the clutch lever with an adjustable clutch lever. And that's kind of disappointing, especially for over $20,000, I think it should have an adjustable lever. So if you've got small hands, I think it's gonna be borderline too big for you. For me, it's too big. You know, if I want to do a clutch up wheelie or something, it's like right at the edge and kind of uncomfortable even. Sure, it has an up and down quick shifter, so you don't use it as much as other bikes, but this is an everyday sports bike. And in traffic, you're pulling in that clutch a lot. And with that big reach, it's quite uncomfortable and I think it should be closer or ideally an adjustable lever. Let's talk about the dash. It has a nice TFT dash, it's clear and easy to read. As you can see, it does get a little bit of glare every now and again. So maybe a little bit more of a matte cover on this would have been good to have. But overall, I didn't have a manual or anything, but I figured out how to use it quite quickly. So on the right, we've got a kill switch, starter button, light switch, and your engine maps. So if we hit this, you can see the engine map changes from commute to dynamic to individual. Then if we hold it in, that's when it takes you to your different rider modes. So these two are unadjustable, then this bottom is adjustable. Hey, adjust everything is on this here. It's very easy to use. This is the select button, this is your up and down. So you select, and it shows you that, and you go across, up and down, then you hit it again, it goes across, 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 across. Then to get out, just hit back. 
we've got a trip meter, time, max speed, average speed, average fuel, and your current fuel economy. And then we've got our odometer. If you scroll across, you've got trip A and trip B, and this is exactly the same, but through here. Now, if we hit it again, you can connect your phone up, change your music, and also have voice control. Unfortunately, you have to buy a module to activate those options, which is a bit annoying. I think those features should come stock. Overall, it's a nice dash, and I like the dash. It's easy to use once you wrap your head around it. At first, it's a little bit daunting, especially without an owner's manual like me, and I couldn't find one online. Uh, I'd searched far and wide, I just couldn't find one. That's annoying because other models, you can just download them for free off the internet. Let's answer a couple of questions on the RS660. Is it good for commuting? Yes, but there are better bikes for it. For a sports bike though, very good. Is it good for touring? Yeah, not really. Uh, it can do, you know, pretty big days on it, but I'd rather ride something else. But this is all you got, bloody go for it. Is it good on fuel? It is fantastic on fuel. I've done 700 kilometers, an average 4.7 liters per hundred, and that's included a lot of city riding through terrible traffic. Expect a maximum of about 300 kilometers per tank. Okay, let's get into the nitty gritty of the video and give my rating for it. Do I think this is a good bike? I think this is a fantastic bike and I really have absolutely nailed it. The engine is super fun, it sounds fantastic and it goes very well. The quick shifter is an absolute blast to use. The brakes are great and the suspension is quite good and the stock tires are brilliant. They're such good tires. It's not perfect though. And I think for the update, they have a couple of things to fix. I think it needs slightly higher spec suspension. It needs an adjustable clutch lever. It's too far of a reach. And the downshifter is just a bit fiddly sometimes to use. But overall, this is a fantastic motorcycle and I would definitely recommend getting one. The next question is, would I buy one? Well, there's a bit of a story to that because when I moved back from America, I was pretty hard up on getting one of these. I really wanted one. I thought it'd be a perfect complement to an adventure bike and I'd still take it to the track and have a blast in the mountains and stuff. And you know, a bit of a bit of a fool on it. But it's too expensive. I think this bike is too expensive. In Australia, it is $20,700 right away. That is, that's a lot. Yes, you heard that right. That is a lot of money. And compared to the competition, I just think it's too expensive. So we have to look at what we can get for $20,000. Well, more precisely, a lot less than $20,000. Ones that come to mind, and I'll put more on a list on the screen. MT-09 SP, Z900 Special Edition, KTM 890 Duke R. You know, that thing's off its head, and that's much cheaper than this bike. So I think this bike is probably two, even $3,000 too expensive. They initially said it was gonna be in the $18,000 mark right away, and I thought, oh man, that's too expensive. This was like 16 dollars right away, I would have just bought one. That would have been about the right spot, maybe even 17.9 max, but 20,700 is just too expensive. So it probably have just announced the Twino 660 factory, and that has higher spec suspension than this. This bike should have that suspension for less money. Okay, that's it from me. Let me know what you think of the Prilia RS660. Have you bought one? Do you think they're too expensive? Would you like to own one? Let me know in the comments below. In the meantime, keep it on the back wheel, people. Hit that like and subscribe button. Catch us later.